This is your friendly neighborhood author, Jonathan, and you are listening to Season 5 of the Floor Rejects Podcast, The Isle of Artemisia. Welcome back to the Floor Rejects Podcast. This is, of course, your friendly neighborhood author, Jonathan. This is the second time I've recorded this episode because the first time I didn't realize that my charger was causing my phone to buzz the whole time. So, let's try this again. If you're new here, every week I read to you a chapter of a story I'm working on. This season, it's the Isle of Artemisia, all about a band of friends who are shipwrecked on an island. Some of them are kidnapped by people who live on the island in a not problematic way. And then, is is this whole story based on... No, because they're brainwashed. So that's... It's okay. They're brainwashed by a crazy plant. Um, And last week, our main character saved the person, Anaxos, who had saved him originally. Um, And there's a whole conversation between them about where Anaxos came from, how he met the person that they met on the boat, Elliot, how he was in love with Elliot and how they lived together for a long time. And then finally they broke up and well, they didn't really break up. Anaxos left the others who are the other people on the island, the scary kidnapping people. Um, And Elliot didn't. And so they were separated from each other for a hundred years. And then after that, there's a kind of a tense, sensual scene in which Anaxos kind of presents himself to Barrett, and Barrett isn't quite ready for it. It's a little bit intense for him. And so that's kind of where we left off. So let's get into this chapter. Chapter 18, Fruition. Barrett wakes up to the sound of whispering. At first, he isn't sure what he's hearing his brain still addled from sleep. Then he registers it. It was the sound of his name. He turns over on his little cot and he sees Nick squatted next to him, looking intensely at him. Barrett leans up, looking around to find that the others are still asleep. Come with me, Nick whispers. Barrett stands and follows out into the early morning sunlight. The water was calm, almost no movement coming from it up onto shore. Nick pulls him gently by the arm, farther from the hut, until the man seems confident that they're out of the earshot of anyone who might be listening. What, Nick? Baird asks, and Nick looks at him intently. What happened last night? He asks. He was serious, his face solemn. Why does it matter? Baird asks, a bit confused as to why he'd woken up at the crack of dawn when Nick could have just gotten the answer later in the day when everyone was awake. Distantly, a dog barks somewhere on the aisle. I... I am worried. What if the others come back for us? Nick asks. He almost looks genuinely nervous, but not quite. Suddenly, Barrett was starting to realize that the same suspicions that Anaxos had been feeling might be right, and it might be the right time to ask Nick about those suspicions. But Nick takes him by the arm, pulling him closer. Barrett, tell me. Nick says, his voice low and intense. Barrett pulls away. He didn't like to be manhandled. Nothing important. We saw the others on the boat, and they got the better of us. We got tossed off of it, so we swam back and finally got back to you guys after another one of them attacked us from the forest, Barrett explains. It was oversimplified, but he didn't owe this man an explanation, and he especially didn't when it was this early after the night he'd had. Who attacked you? Nick asks. He was too serious to just be interested. His gaze was pointed. Barrett can feel his face twist as a confused look as Nick takes his arm yet again. I didn't ask his name, Nick. We just got out of there, Barrett says. Nick nods after a moment. What did he look like? Nick furthers, and Barrett is at the end of his rope. I don't know, Nick. I didn't get a great look at him in the dark. Now, if you'll let go of me, I'm going back to sleep. You can just talk to X, Barrett says, pulling his arm free. He turns on his heel in the sand and begins to walk back to the hut. As he does, suddenly he starts to feel a sense of guilt at snapping at the man. He turns to apologize or at least explain himself, but when he does, the beach is empty. There's no sign of Nick. 
He stares for a moment, unsure where the man could have gone, except for back into the forest. He wonders about it for a moment and then heads back towards the hut again, this time plotting the nap until the others got up and not worry about Nick. As he draws closer, Anaxo steps out from the hut, shielding his eyes from the sun, then stretching before spotting Barrett on the beach, walking towards him. When Barrett draws close, Anaxos takes him gently by the crook of his arm, leading him around the side of the hut, sheltering them from the intense morning sun. Barrett didn't find the contact nearly as annoying as he did when Nick had grabbed him. Barrett? What was that? he asks, jerking his head towards the spot where Nick had been standing. I don't know. He was asking me about last night, Barrett says, and Anaxos' eyes narrow. Why? Anaxos asks, and Barrett shrugs, noticing the way that he could see his own reflection in Anaxos' eyes. I told you, I do not trust him, Anaxos says, his other hand coming up to grip Barrett's shoulder. It was a soft touch, firm but somehow gentle at the same time, and Barrett can feel himself lean into it. Anaxos' eyes softened at the movement. Where did he go? Anaxos asks, his voice softer. I don't know. One minute he was standing there, and when I turned around he was gone, Barrett says. He can feel heat radiating from Anaxos' palm. It was pleasant. It distracts him for a moment, and he looks at the man's hand. It was large, with thick muscular fingers and fingernails that were oddly clean for a man marooned on an island. As Barrett makes a note of this, he turns back to Anaxos, ready to say something, but the thoughts fall from his mind as suddenly a set of lips gently brush against his. He freezes, eyes closing as Anaxos pulls him closer, his nose whistling as their faces press together. And then, all of a sudden, Anaxos' lips are gone. Barrett opens his eyes. What was that for? I mean, yeah, what was that for? Barrett asks, his body quietly vibrating in Anaxos' hands. You saved me. I was thanking you, Anaxos says. His mouth splits into a crooked grin. Is that how they thank people in Greece? Barrett asks, and Anaxos chuckles. I wouldn't know. I have not been there in 150 years, he says quietly. It was a surprise to Barrett to have the man interested in him. Barrett leans harder into Anaxos' hand, and Anaxos' grin grows wider. You are strong, Barrett. I can tell. I like that, Anaxos says. How would you know? We only met a few days ago, Barrett asks, not willing to argue it too far if it meant more gentle kisses and caresses. You survive. You were stuck, your friends were taken, your boat was sunk, the others came for you, but you are still here. You are still okay, Anaxos says, his voice getting deeper and deeper. I'm not okay. I'm incredibly not okay, but you've been so kind. You helped me, Barrett says. Anaxos kisses him again, softly. His mouth is warm, soft, supple. His hands slide up Barrett's arms, up to his shoulders, and then up to cup Barrett's face. It clicked for him all at once. He'd been stuck on this island for a matter of days, but for him it felt like an eternity. He could only imagine how it felt being stuck, completely alone on this beach, away from a man he'd loved for over a hundred years. From the way that Anaxos' lips pried at his, trying to open him up, Barrett knew that this feeling was intense. Then Barrett pulls away, his mind rolling on waves of endorphins. He smiles up at Anaxos. Rays of sun form a halo around the man's head. We, uh, is this a good idea? Barrett asks. Anaxos gives him another kind smile. Who will it hurt? He asks. And then his hands slide down to wrap around Barrett's waist, pressing their bodies together. I guess you're right. Barrett says, reaching up on tiptoe to pull Anaxos' face down to kiss him in earnest. He had a fleeting thought that he hadn't brushed his teeth in who knew how long, but he forgets as they kiss again and begin a delicate introductory dance with their lips. They were new to each other, sure, but somehow they reciprocated one another flawlessly, as if they'd been doing it for years. 
Their movements were intricate, and they anticipated each other's moves without pause. Then, Barrett finds himself pressed up against the side of the hut. The building flexes against them, and Barrett moans gently into an axis's mouth. An axis makes a small laugh, digging his fingers into Barrett's back. Barrett arches against him, and an axis's hands drift lower, sinking into the flesh of Barrett's ass. Are you two seriously doing this? Right here? Against the hut? Crystal's voice shatters their entanglement. Barrett looks over to see her standing there, her arms crossed. Her foot taps in the sand. Barrett pushes Anaxos up, as the man was seemingly content to ignore her. Anaxos gives her a smile. He didn't seem concerned with her need to interrupt them. Chris, what are you doing up? Barrett asks, looking away from Anaxos, dusting himself off. Anaxos's face was slack and his pupils were blown out. I heard rustling and I thought the others were back, but it turns out it was just you two, she says. Barrett can't read her face. She'd been rather difficult to predict. Barrett understood. He didn't blame her, but when she cracks a smile, he can't help but smile back. It was a glimmer of who she really was, and when she puts her hands up in the air and turns around, Barrett is happy to see she isn't frustrated. He pats an axis on the cheek. Later he whispers, before running off after Crystal. He had to make sure she was okay. But as he chases after her, something at the edge of the forest pushes him to charge, knowing that danger was there on the beach. Now, let's have this discussion again. Luckily, contrary to my first recording, my chinchilla was rather quiet today. Wasn't making a whole lot of noise. So let's see if he can um, hold up that end of the bargain that we've struck. As you know, I have been trying to focus less on the things that I don't like about what I write and more on the things that I do like. Oh, I have the hiccups. Because to me, it feels counterproductive to write something and then immediately tear it apart, which is what I have done in the past. But I kind of want to give myself a little grace, especially right now in my life. I deserve a little bit of grace. Not I deserve. I don't deserve anything. But I would like to give myself a little grace, and I can do that. So some things that I like, and I've listed them, like I said, I've already recorded this, so I know kind of where I'm going with this. Number one, I like the juxtaposition between Nick and Anaxos. The way that Nick handles Barrett is similar to the way that Anaxos is kind of presumptuous, and yet Barrett reacts completely differently to the two of them. To Nick, he's kind of like, don't touch me, get off me, leave me alone, I'm doing what I want. But to Anaxos, he just kind of goes along with him, and I like that. I like that... They do the same things. They touch him on the arm. They lead him away. And with Nick, Barrett's like, stop that. And with Anaxos, he's just like, okay, I'll follow you wherever you take me. Um, I like that they kiss in this scene, and that's really it. They, in the last chapter, Anaxos kind of tried and failed to be forward. Um, maybe because he'd been stranded on an island for 150 years and for 100 years he'd been separated from the man that he had loved and so he was kind of out of practice with flirting um, and he came on too strong and Barrett was like, I don't know if I'm ready for that but in this chapter, he comes on softer he, he's gentler and not so, not rough, but not so forward and Barrett responds a lot more positively to that. And I do like that after 10 chapters of them being together, this is the first kind of point of contact we're getting that is successful, that's not like weird and strained. Um, and because this is a first draft, of course there's always the chance that I'm gonna like delete that from the actual story if I ever publish it. You know, I might delete that chapter of him just trying to give some dong, you know? He was really just trying to drop it on Barrett and Barrett was not interested. Or he was, but he was kind of weirded out by how forward it was. Um, and so I like that in this chapter, it's much softer, it's much more subtle, and yet it's very intense, obviously. And I like that they talk, they're, they're talking, is this okay, is this a good idea? And then Axos just says, who's it gonna hurt? I mean, this is the ideal scenario in which you just have a fling with somebody because 
Barrett's trying to get off the aisle and Crystal, Daniel, supposedly Nick, are trying to get off the aisle and Anaxos is trying to help them. So it is going to end eventually. And I like that Anaxos is just kind of like, it's not going to hurt me if it's not going to hurt you. Let's do this. And Barrett responds to that and he's kind of like, okay, let's, let's play with this. Um, something else that I outlined before and that I wanted to touch on was Crystal as a character. We haven't dealt with her much. When she was on the boat, when she was on the initial, on the I, not the island, but in Greece, she was happy-go-lucky Crystal. She gets on the island, she kind of reveals to Barrett, I'm off my meds, I'm having a hard time. And she's a little more difficult, like Barrett says, to predict, to, to deal with, honestly. I think I can say that as somebody with mental illness. She's more difficult to deal with, to predict, to interact with. And I like that instead of demonizing her every single time something happens to her, every single time she's in a scene, this time she just shows up. She could be annoyed with them for waking her up, and yet she's just kind of like, I'll let you two do your thing. Okay, I'm stepping to the side. And she smiles. And I feel like so often, even though we talk about mental health all the time and, and, and discuss it and we say, oh, we're not demonizing it, we still kind of do demonize it. And I think discussing it and discussing both sides of it, the fact that when you are somebody who has a mental illness and you have to take medicine for it, when you take that medicine, you're a different person than when you don't. And when you don't take it, you can still be glimpses of your happy person or your, your stable person or your whatever. Whatever your ideal situation is, you can still be that person sometimes. It's just harder than other times. And I know that's oversimplified. And I know that it's not like the most complex analysis of it. But I do like that it gives... Crystal a bit of her humanity back when she's like obviously struggling. She's having a hard time and she isn't that important in the story or she isn't, obviously she's not that important because we don't spend that much time with her and she was the first one to be abducted. So we've literally spent the least amount of time with her. Um, but I like that it still gives her a little bit of dimension. It gives her a chance to say for herself, you know, with her actions I'm still in here. I'm, it's still me. I'm still in here. I'm not like, I'm not somebody else. I just don't have my medication and I'm stranded on a desert island and I've been abducted and the boat that I was on sank. So forgive me if I'm having a hard time and I don't have my medicine. You know, I like that. I do like that. And I like this. The other thing that I, I said that I liked and that I will back up that I like is I like the imagery of this chapter. The imagery of Nick squatted next to the bed, of him pulling Barrett down the beach. I like the idea that Barrett turns away from him and then he turns right back to him and he's gone. I like that. Um, I like the imagery of Anaxos getting out of the hut and stretching in the sunlight and then leading Barrett. It's just, to me, it feels like a chapter where you can kind of see everything that's happening. And I do like that. I, When I read a story, I want to be able to see it in my mind's eye. And I don't see pictures, if that makes sense, in my head. I just see words. And so I like to be able to paint the picture with the words in my head. And I think that this chapter is a good example, even if it's a rough draft of that kind of thing. So that's what I liked about this chapter. Some things that I could work on, having a quieter pet, that would be one thing, Klaus, maybe. Maybe we could work on that together. Um, I really the length of the chapters is the issue. You know, I would love to be able to write 7,000 word chapters every week and present them to you guys and read them and really have an in-depth discussion and polish the chapters and present you with a finished piece of work every week. But that's just not a possibility for me. So I'm gonna say that that's something I'd like to work on, but it's something I can't really do that much about. Um, Otherwise, I'd be spending all my time doing it. And while the idea of being a writer full-time is ideal, I would like to be a writer full-time and not also have a full-time job that isn't writing. Um, what else do I not like about it? Not that I don't like about it, but some things that I feel like I could work on. Mm, I think the, the 
consistency of an actress's speech pattern I could work on. And part of it is just my delivery of it. And part of it is that sometimes he's got a grasp on the English language a little better than he does in other parts. And not like a grasp on it, but he is a little more fluent in it sometimes than others. And I guess that could be the case. That could just be what it's like. Um, originally when I wrote the outline for this, he couldn't speak English. Um, he just spoke Greek. And I figured that would be pretty hard to do. Not impossible, but again, I'm just writing this part-time for fun. And so I thought it would be a little bit easier if instead of that, I did some research and found out that the English came and fought alongside the Greek in the war for Greek independence. And so he learned English and obviously he learned it through Eliot. And so he's got kind of a, he's got kind of a Duolingo double language thing going on. He's bilingual, I guess, or maybe trilingual. Who knows how many languages he knows? Um, but I like, I, I, I like that, but I, I think that a little more consistency would be good. Um, same for Nick, even though he doesn't speak that much, he's not that important, at least not yet. Um, I do think a little more consistency would be good. So that's something I can probably work on. Um, but I'm not going to harp on myself too much. I'm not going to do that. You're not here for negativity. If you want to send me a critique or something you like or just how your day's been, you can email me, floorrejects at gmail.com. You can tweet me, floorrejects on Twitter. Um, let me know. Let me know something. I don't know. I'm just interested in making friends. I like to make some friends on the internet or something. I don't know. But until next week, I've been your friendly neighborhood author, Jonathan, and uh, I'll have a chapter for you this next Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whenever you're listening to this. Okay, bye.